Almost everything we do in, in my lab is concerned with brain imaging, broadly defined. So we, we in particular look at electroencephalography, or EEG, and derivatives of that, so brain electrical activity. And we also, with, in collaboration with colleagues, uh, for example, Dr. Mike Noseworthy, uh, we do MRI, and again, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, and there are a range of different types of measures within that world. So we do several of them, uh, and including functional magnetic resonance imaging. All of it aimed at how do we comprehend speech? How do we identify a spoken word? Uh, how do we read? So I work with colleagues like Dr. Cooperman, Dr. Service, in our department about how, uh, how we read. How does the brain process a script? How does it change that script or text into a meaningful language unit? Uh, just in the same way, how does an acoustic signal, which initially is no different than uh, a telephone ringing or a dog barking. How, do, how is it we, or our brains, process that and, and effectively recognize it as speech, recognize it as a as speech in a language we understand? And then how do we do the sounds of it, the phonology it's called, of it, the semantics of it? How do we get the meaning of it? How do we process that the syntax you know, the noun-verb agreement, uh, which sounds very technical, but all that means is if I say, uh, I, uh, I were going to the store, everyone watching or listening knows that's incorrect, that's a grammatical error. So you see all of these types of things in brain responses, uh, be they normal or abnormal in some fashion or incongruent, and we study that. We use these same measures and markers of brain activity to identify problems in people who have sustained a brain injury or have a neurodevelopmental disorder uh, to better understand their language deficits and what might be done to correct them if possible. Uh, and again, the implications of that are that very often people who have these difficulties communicating, the presumption is that what you see is what you get, that because they are not demonstrating mental life and cognitive function at any high level, that therefore they do not possess these abilities, that they are no longer um, functioning appropriately in the cognitive domain. They're not thinking and remembering things the way, say, we do. Uh, and we've demonstrated that that's incorrect. Uh, not always, but in uh, roughly 20% of, of the people we've seen, that that is absolutely incorrect. So, and in fact, in the literature, uh, there are now three studies that have demonstrated that what is referred to as a consensus diagnosis, and that's, for example, uh, several physicians getting together and agreeing that this patient before them is in a vegetative state, uh, that even with sophisticated uh, behavioral measures, uh, but strictly behavioral, no neuroimaging, no other types of uh, what you could call neurophysiological measures, that those consensus diagnoses are wrong about 40% of the time. And that has huge impl implications for the patients because if the belief is that you won't benefit from intervention and therapy, you won't receive it. Uh, and in some of these cases, that's absolutely wrong. And we've had very uh, notable cases where uh, our assessment indicated that the patient was incorrectly diagnosed. I've had the good fortune of working with physicians who respond to that information and, and they have done then the interventions, nothing new, just standard interventions. And we've, in, in several of these cases, uh, we've had enormous therapeutic responses that have been very uh, beneficial.